And the canon describes how you remember your past lives through the powers of concentration. It's all pretty basic. This is your name. This is your appearance. This is the kind of food you ate. This is your experience of pleasure and pain, and this is how you died. That's it. And then you do it again, and then again. It seems awfully bare bones, and we realize that each individual life has a lot more in terms of the narratives you could spin around it. But one of the whole purposes of the practice is to get it down to the bare bones. Pleasure and pain are things that we experience very privately, but we want to make them public. We talk about them a lot. We spin a lot of narratives around them. You may know the story of Ishi, the, the last wild Indian in California. He ended up working in an anthropological museum in Brooklyn. And the, the people there kept saying, take us back to your old stamping grounds. And at first he didn't want to go. And then finally they went out and he got to back where he'd been with his family. Of course, it brought back a lot of painful memories. His family was no longer there. But there were some pleasant memories as well, particularly a, a big bear hunt where they'd successfully gotten a bear. And they really feasted. And he had a lot of stories to tell about the feast. Recently we had a lot of people coming from Thailand, students of a John Fu, people with whom I had helped build a jetty, build a Buddha image, build an ordination hall. And a lot of our conversation was reliving the pleasures of that, even though it was a difficult time, it was a lot of heavy work, still it was something we really enjoyed, and we bonded around that. So we like to tell stories about our pleasures, our mutual pleasures, to give the illusion that we experience these things in common. We tell stories about our pains. Recently I was reading a, an account of a woman who had helped counsel people after the tsunami in Thailand. And she commented how everybody had a story to tell and wanted to tell it. to connect their private pains to somebody else. And so our pleasures and pains take on meaning. And one of the purposes of the meditation is to start taking that tendency apart, because we keep on looking for more and more pleasures to spin out over which we can bond with other people. And that's what keeps us coming back again and again and again to pleasures, but then again to a lot of pains as well. Once you focus on pleasure and pain as the big issues in your life, you're going to keep pursuing the pleasures, trying to run away from the pains, and then talking them over and creating lots of narratives about both the pleasures and the pains to try to make some sense out of all this. But the Buddha has you trying to make sense in a different way. This is what the practice of mindfulness is all about. He talks about their pleasures, pains, neither pleasures nor pains. Some of them are what he calls pleasures of the flesh, amisa. Others are pleasures not of the flesh. They're also pains of the flesh, pains not of the flesh. Feelings of equanimity of the flesh, not of the flesh. And instead of focusing on what they mean to you, he says, focus on what they do to you. Certain pleasures, when you pursue them, and they don't just happen, a pleasure comes and you pursue it. Sometimes pains come and you pursue them. But what happens to the mind when you focus on these things, when you hang around with them? Identify yourself around them. What's the result? What happens? What kind of skillful or unskillful qualities develop? Do you look at that? For the most part, we don't. We're interested in something else, which would be called wrong mindfulness. We're remembering the wrong things, the wrong details around these. Because the Buddha wants you to focus on what you can do with these things, so you can develop skillful qualities of mind and abandon unskillful ones. 
some pleasures, he said, are actually good for you. Others, other, other pleasures are not. And you want to notice that. And you focus on this issue, like when your meditation is going well. You can focus on the fact that it's going well and develop skillful qualities in mind, and you can develop unskillful ones. The unskillful ones, could, you could start getting complacent. There could be a sense of pride that goes around that, especially in places where people start comparing their jhanas. When the meditation is not going well, you can either use that as a skillful or an unskillful source for states of mind. And to see that clearly, it's one of the reasons why we try to have a sense of seclusion around here, even though there are lots of people here right now. We want each person to have his or her own space to look at these things directly. As the Buddha says, when there's a pleasure that accords with the Dhamma, you don't reject it. We're not here trying to burn off past karma by inflicting ourselves with pain. It's simply there are times when you focus on the pleasure, or you pursue pleasures or pleasant meditation, and you find that you're getting more complacent or you're getting lazy, or unskillful qualities are developing one way or another. And that's when you have to practice with pain, and that can either mean sitting longer periods of time and enduring more pain, or taking up a painful meditation object, contemplation of the body that list of the thirty-two parts that we chant. The Buddha calls that actually a painful practice. And he says you take it on when you realize you need that kind of practice to counteract unskillful tendencies in the mind. So we need a sense of seclusion here, a sense of being by ourselves. Because when there's a lot of interaction, there are a lot of narratives. And the narratives blind you to, what are these pleasures doing to you? What are these pains doing to you? Even a simple matter of putting up with unpleasant words. As the Buddha said, or excuse me, I think it's Sari Buddha, was saying that you focus on the fact that you've got an ear that's made out of physical elements. And the sounds will hit the ear. Sometimes the sounds will be pleasant, and sometimes they'll be unpleasant. And when somebody's yelling at you or someone's being really nasty in their words, it tells you to remind yourself, an unpleasant sound has made contact at the ear. It's almost comical, because we don't usually stop it with that thought. We continue. So why is that person saying that? Why do they have no respect for me. Why do they look down or whatever the reaction is? And then we go spinning out another narrative. So even some, something simple like that, unpleasant sounds making contact at the ear, they will happen even in a community where people are trying to be quiet. Unfortunately, we don't have that many long, drawn-out narratives. So we have time here to notice, okay, an unpleasant sound has made contact with the ear. What do I do with that? When there's a pain in the body, when you sit and meditate, what can you do with that? The Buddha doesn't tell you just to sit there and accept it. You ask yourself, what's causing it? How are you going to find out what causes it? Well, you try to change things. Change your breath and you realize the pain goes away. You've realized something important. It's simply the way you breathe. That's what the Buddha calls a bodily fabrication can have an impact on feelings of pleasure or pain. The way you perceive a feeling of pleasure or the way you perceive a feeling of pain, that can also have an impact on how you experience it. In other words, the label you apply to it can either inflame the pain or it can reduce the pain. <clears throat> reduce the pain. So you're looking at these things from the point of view of right mindfulness. Remembering, this is what you want to look out for, is what is this doing to the mind? Is it leading to skillful qualities or unskillful qualities? And the fewer narratives are swirling around it, then the easier it is to see these things. 
to try to give the mind some space so it can look at these things simply as a process, without all the narrative elaboration. And you find that the mind can rise to a higher level, where instead of concerning itself totally with the pursuit of pleasure and trying to run away from pain, you can see that pain has its uses, pleasure has its uses. Some pains, some pleasures. And when you can sort that out, you've accomplished a great deal. <laughs>